Thank you for coming out this evening for a special Mad Monster 35th anniversary screening of the original Friday the 13th. If you will please give a big round of applause for the composer of the original Friday the 13th, as well as two, three, four, five, six, yeah. nine, ten. <laughs> uh, please give a big welcome to Harry Mandrini. this evening, Harry, and uh, part of League's been 35 years now since this movie first came out May of May 9th, 1980. Uh, so, <laughs> now, before you came, became involved with Friday the 13th, you had already previously worked with Sean Cunningham and Steve Miner and, and Victor Miller on two previous movies, correct? Yes. And so, can you talk a little bit about, about working with them on, and then what led into Friday the 13th? Well, actually, um, oh, okay, I had worked with Sean more than anyone. Uh, Steve was an editor at the time. Steve was one of the editors. Uh, we did a couple of children's films that were complete disasters. Uh, one was called Here Come the Tigers. It was basically the Bad News Bears with tigers. Uh, and then there was another one that was going to be huge called uh, Manny's Orphans. Uh, which was about soccer. It was basically, here come the tigers about soccer. <laughs> uh, and if you look really close, I have a uh, about a six second cameo in that, in which I was my first actual act. There were talk of Oscars and stuff, but I did a six second talking head that was terrible. Anyway, uh, but I was just at Sean's house one day. I mean, we were just trying to put food on the table. And uh, Sean said, oh, I'm doing a horror picture next and you're going to write the score, and it's going to be the scariest mover you ever. And I said, okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, and off we went. Uh, I had not met Victor until subsequently when I actually finished the score. We had dinner uh, on 10th Avenue. Uh, Steve, you know, was an editor, and uh, I just got to know Steve. Uh, but he, I'm not sure if he was the main editor on uh, the first picture. But we had worked together, and you know, we were just all trying to, you know, make a living, put food on the table. You, you know, we all know what that's like, right? So here we are. So at what point, at what stage did you, or do you typically come on board a production? Uh, and, and tell us a little bit about the work that, you know, you have to plan out and map out. Do you have access to the script ahead of time that you begin, you know, processing in your mind what possibly could work and then go into the actually seeing the visuals, or how does that all work? With horror pictures, I tend not to want to read the script. I tend not to want to see the dailies. I tend not to want to know anything. I want to see the picture at least in a fairly good rough cut. With Friday the 13th, I, I didn't read the script. Thank God, because I would have are you out of your mind? Uh, but I, I, I want to see the picture straight through the first time. Just like a couple of you, these two people, a lady up there, a girl over there, are going to see it for the first time. Because you only get to see a movie the first time once. And I want to get the visceral reaction to the picture. I want to see where the real scares are. I want to see what my job is going to be to scare the pants off of everybody to try to get you to relax so I know something's going to happen. So I, I want to get that one feeling. I can see the the overall arc of the picture. I want to see what it's really going to take, what this picture really needs musically. If I already know what's going to happen and somebody jumps out of a closet and stabs somebody, I, I can't get that feeling of the person jumping out of the closet because I already know it's going to happen. So you only get one shot at it the first time. So with horror pictures especially, I only like to see the actual picture. I, I come on at the very end. There wasn't any music in it when I saw it, which it's hysterically funny with no music. <laughs> now, how different was that for early rough cut that you first saw compared to the final cut of the movie? Uh, it was practically the same. There was very, very, very little changes. Uh, subsequent versions of Friday got. Uh, edited a lot more uh, thanks to the MPAA and things like that. But for the most part, the picture was exactly the way the way I saw it. 
So talk a little bit about your collaboration process with, well, with on the first movement, Sean Cunningham as director. How much freedom does he give you to, to create the musical world that you want to create? How much input, how much day-to-day -day impact does he have on that process? Day-to-day, uh, -day, day -day, very little. Uh, we, we've already done two pictures that he trusted me and he still trusts me. And uh, we basically, you know, our contracts are like, uh, you do the music and that's good. All right, so it's like that. It's very, he's very, very trusting with what I'm going to come up with. On occasion, I, I remember a couple of times where uh, in a different, completely different movie where I had written something and he went, oh, you went, ah. And I wanted you to go, oh, and I went, oh. So then I changed my, uh, I thought about, oh, and then he was happy. But sometimes, I, but for the most part, he trusts me. As far as the collaboration goes, after I saw the picture, I realized uh, we, had, we had one real uh, problem uh, with the picture, and it was a dramatic problem. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to go off of for a while, okay. One of, the most, one of the most important things of being a film composer is that you're really a dramatist. You're really dealing with the story and with the drama. Sometimes I'm way more dramatist than I am composer. I, sometimes just one note works, you know, but I don't have to write some fugue or some crazy thing that I learned in school. I would just, just one note, ooh, that's really, that's pulling, that's making it happen. So one of the problems dramatically in this picture, and I'm about to give you a, the ones who haven't seen the movie cover your ears and eyes. <laughs> one of the problems in the movie is that you don't know who the killer is. This is really a murder mystery, isn't it? In a, in a way, when you really get down to it. It's a murder mystery. And you don't know who the killer is. Although, very often, from very beginning of the picture, there's a POV of the killer. like. You become the killer. The cameraman becomes the killer. So my job was to try to find out how can I get the killer in real one if we don't see the killer until real nine? I mean, how does the audience know it's not the cameraman? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So that my job, that was the first thing I had, my first problem dramatically. And I said to Sean, I said, my first idea is that we should only have music for the killer. And if you watch this movie, those of you who have seen it a bazillion times, are gonna, you're going to have an enjoyable trip because I'm going to tell you a few things. There's actually very little music in this film. The other thing is that be very aware of how the music goes out and how the music comes back in. There's a million places in this film when you watch it, you go like, if, if this were any other film, there would have been music. But we decided, no, only for the killer. So that's one thing. I mean, I'll give you two examples, and this, this, and you won't have to worry. You don't have to cover your ears. Early on in the movie, Steve Christie is bare-chested, manly guy, and and uh, Adrian King is up there, I think, hammering uh, on a, my right, hammering on the the, uh, yeah. the gutter. Thank you. And she shows him a picture. And they talk about, and he goes, is this the way I look? And she goes, that's the way you looked last night. And there's a moment where you, you feel like there might have been something going on between the two of them. And he walks by her and just touches her face with his hand, doesn't he? Yep. Any other film, there would have been like a little, oh, 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 <laughs> kind of cue, a music cue. But no, there's no music. There's no music for that. Later on in the picture, uh, they're setting up the archery uh, part of the camp. And the goofy, wacky guy decides to shoot an arrow into the, the bullseye while the girl is setting up the, uh, uh, the what do I call it, the bullseye. Anyway, again, there would have been a sting the size of Pittsburgh in every other film. I mean, it would be like, bam, oh my god, it's an arrow, you know. There is no music there. Be really aware of how I take the music out and how I bring the music back. Watch it, because here's the trick, dramatically. 
how many of you, well, she's like all 13 years old, but uh, you, you remember in the old, uh, the old carnival days when some guy would like hit, the manly guy would you'd hit the thing with the hammer and the thing would go up and ding, and well, he's manly because he hit the bell, okay? What's it called? The high striker. The high striker. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, anyway, what's happening is this. In this film, you're sitting there and you're at a seven. You're, you're at a seven. So if I scare you, the most I can get out of you is three. Because you can't go higher than ten. Okay? So my job is to get you to come down from seven. To get maybe to get you down to three. And then, wham, hit you at seven. Uh, I'll give you another place to watch. And this is where acting comes in. There's a scene where Adrian is, I'm, without giving anything away, Adrian is in a kitchen. And in her hand, I believe, is a baseball bat and like a fork for a turkey. What do they call them? Carving fork. A turkey fork. Okay, all right. <laughs> she's standing there and she's scared. You know, she's been being chased and she's scared to heck. And all when she stops, and she goes like this. <sighs> she sighs. Watch the music go out with her sigh, because I want, she's, she, oh, for a moment there, she feels like I'm okay. And I get the music out. And there's no music for a long time. I, well, not for a long time, because I'm setting you up to get hit. Watch the music go in and out. It's really interesting, it's fun to do. And look, I still haven't given away who the murderer is. Uh, what, and let's go to the last, the absolute last scene. And this is another brilliant thing that everybody did. Uh, we all know about the last scene, except for the six people who don't know about the last scene. That scene went out for so long that everyone gave up. And that was the trick was that everybody saw, there's a different movie called Carrie. Did you see that movie? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, uh, yeah. Carrie, yeah. It, it, was a, it was a, I think it was one of those Bollywood films. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie, anyway. And Carrie, you know, it was like, uh, 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 bam, Carrie. Okay. Well, what happened here, what happens here is that everybody gave up. The, and and the, the music was going on. And, oh, uh, yeah, well, let's go. Okay, let's put our coat on. Let's go. And, and no, the people who saw Carrie go, no, 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 something's going to happen. You know, and then, of course, finally the people who saw Carrie gave up. And everybody had given up because it just went on for so long. And, of course, then it happened, and that's when everybody goes, you know, everybody went crazy. Or at least six people here will go crazy. Uh, anyway, so there was that. One of the fun problems about that was I was about to score that, and I'm going like, oh, this is great. I haven't written one melody in this entire film, and now I have to write a melody. So uh, I wrote this country western song that plays in the bar, in, not in the bar, in the uh, diner, uh, Sail Away Tiny Sparrow, which was a ripoff of a Dolly Parton tune. Yeah. It was some, somewhere in that Dolly Parton tune it said fly away a little bluebird and I went to a little bluebird and sparrow. All right. Anyway, so I wrote this song. It was the only melody I actually wrote. So if you listen really closely, the music that's playing in the boat where uh, she's in the boat by herself, well, I said to myself, mm, she's in a boat, she's sailing away, everything's cool. So I just took the melody from the diner and played it a little bit slower and flashed it and stuff. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that song, though, uh, one of the, you know there was that great box set from La La Land that came out a couple years ago, and one of the things about it, the pitch seems a little bit different on the box set compared to how it is in the movie. Was that, a, a, was that you, are you aware, was that a conscious choice? Or? Yeah. <laughs> well, I have no idea why the pitch changed. My only guess is that La La Land did a reprocessing of every piece. What happens in, in film, especially this is a movie that's 30 years old, 35 years old? Yeah, I wrote it when I was 10. <laughs> and it was 35 years ago. This is, this is on a piece of mag tape. Lord knows what happened to this tape. 
it got transferred again, and then it got transferred again. And then it, 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 things change. And what happened was when it got to be processed probably by La La Land, they said, you know, it's a little, it's kind of slow, isn't it? You know, so all at once they kicked it up a little higher. The pitch changes. Suddenly it doesn't sound like a, it sounds like a girl singing and there was a boy singing and, 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 and it's not the same key and everything like that. So it's just something that happened. It's still the same, still the same song. Uh, there was something else I wanted to say. Nobody here, nobody actually asked me why. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually, I, I wanted to go ahead and step in there since you just mentioned. But um, so you've told this story many, many times, and I'm sure you'll tell it many, many more times to come. 